Allah wa ta'ala wa Peace be upon you all and God's blessing and mercy. The topic that I've been asked to address today um, is building on our roots 400 years of Islam in America. This is going to be a journey into our shared path. And I'm going to start with um, a quotation that is a reminder of our shared past. This is from a Christian evangelical text produced in the 1840s by the text was called pro-slavery interpretations that are productive of infidelity. A progressive preacher before the Civil War may, uh, gathered up a bunch of experiences of his and teachings from the Bible into a book. I think, am I too tall for the mic? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. I'm gonna, I, it actually doesn't reach. Is the sound better now? Yeah. Okay. Do I need to start again? <laughs> so pro-slavery interpretations of the Bible that are productive of infidelity. This progressive um, preacher in the 1840s decided that he wasn't going to make, make much progress trying to spread Christianity to enslaved African Americans by using the Bible as a weapon to hit them over the head. Serve your masters here on earth and you will have the good pleasure of serving them in heaven as well he argued, is not a particularly convincing argument to, <laughs> to get African Americans to embrace Christianity. So he gathered stories that were supportive of his progressive position because he was concerned with the common humanity um, and the breach of that common humanity that was the institution of slavery. So he tells a story um, that had been told to him a number of years earlier about an enslaved Muslim man who had been sold at the port of Savannah in 1806, about 40 years before he penned this text, and I'll go ahead and read it. In the year 1806, on the arrival of a slaver from the coast of Africa, John Doherty went to the city of Savannah to buy slaves. After several hundred had been sold in lots and single, a suit of the purchasers, a middle-aged man was put upon the stand who wished to make a communication before he was sold, the purport of which was that he was a Mohammedan and that whenever the hour of prayer and other devotional duties came, he must have time to attend to them. Mr. D, who had lately embraced religion and seemed to be zealous to promote the cause, gave the highest price for him, feeling confident within himself that he would soon convert him to the true faith. Taking him to his plantation, he built him a hut and assured him that he should be allowed the time he required, and in addition should have every opportunity to attend all the meetings of the Christians. The Mohammedan slave for a while attended these meetings and learned something of Christianity, without, however, discontinuing his former devotions. Mm. At the expiration of about a year, his master, who was intent on his conversion, asked him formally if he did not prefer Christianity to Mohammedanism, and if he would not openly renounce the prophet and acknowledge Jesus Christ. The slave asked if the Christian religion allowed one Christian to hold another in slavery and their children after them. Mm. The answer, of course, was in the affirmative. The Mohammedan replied that the religion of the prophet did not allow that. The result of all was this slave, in a land of Bibles and gospel ministers, daily said his prayers, performed ablutions, made his prostrations, and at an advanced age died, declaring that God was one God, and Muhammad was his prophet. What was shaping the experience and sensibility of that man on that Savannah dock in 1806 when he made this pro proclamation that his faith was one that confirmed the liberty of humanity. What was in the heart of the reverend who assembled these stories and Bible quotations when he developed this argument that it is a violation of God's law for us to torment one another in the way that slavery has been tormenting African Americans? For that Muslim man at the Savannah Dock in 1806, the training in that kind of ethical understanding of what freedom is began first in Quran schools, where he learned to memorize what Muslims believe to be God's verbatim speech, like the text that was recited in such lovely fashion by the reciter who opened our gathering tonight with a recitation from the Quran. 
I talk uh, at some length, and I'll spare you most of that length tonight, um, about the history of Quran schooling in West Africa in my first book, The Walking Quran. But just to uh, make this brief, the argument of that book is depicted visually here. That Islamic education in West Africa, the institution that shaped the beliefs and sensibilities of not just that man at that Savannah dock in 1806, but of the three million Muslims that were brought to the new world in bondage as slaves. The place where they first encountered Islamic ideas and Islamic understandings was in reciting that sacred text but that Islamic education in West Africa is not just designed to produce an analytical understanding of the text between your ears so that you understand the meaning, but rather it is meant to reproduce living human beings as exemplars of God's sacred speech. So that a human being comprised of God's words then allows that sacred knowledge to flow into the next generation from one hand to the next. So that you embody the text and the ethical values that are contained in the text in your comportment in life. That is what gave a man the courage to make a pronouncement when he was being sold like cattle on a Savannah dock in 1806. He was affirmed that as a human being, he was amongst the most noble of all of God's creation because there is nothing more noble in God's creation than the human being and that's where we will end our lecture tonight in a few minutes. But you could have also depicted the argument of my first book, The Walking Quran, visually with the map that is presented here. And this is a map that I would particularly like our Muslim co-religionists who are not of African background to take note of. Because in the American Muslim community, it is um, African and African American Muslims are often marginalized by some of the same problems and racial dynamics that obtain with anti-black racism in the broader society. Um, my Muslim co-religionists and our non-Muslim friends that are here visiting us are unlikely to know that one in six of the world's Muslims lives in sub-Saharan Africa. That Africa is the only continent in the world that has a Muslim majority that there are more than 330 million Muslims in sub-Saharan Africa, which is more than twice as many Muslims as there are in North Africa. <laughs> you are unlikely to know before you walked into this room that there are more Muslims in Nigeria than there are in Egypt, <laughs> that there are more Muslims in Ethiopia than there are in Iraq, <laughs> that there is a higher percentage of Muslims in Senegal than there is in Syria. I could go on and on at length reciting statistics to you um, and in my Islam in Africa class at the University of Michigan, I see a couple of veterans of that class. <laughs> they know that I did do that, in fact. Like I spent a whole lecture <laughs> just talking about the, dem the demography of Islam in Africa. But Africa is often, often overlooked uh, in the telling of Islam's history. So the argument of that book could also be visually represented in this way, which is the way that, uh, which is a depiction of Bilal, the first, the second adult male to embrace the religion of Islam, okay. and the first person to make the call to prayer in the religion, um, when Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, made his bloodless conquest of the city of Mecca when he returned um, from exile. Um, so humbled by the fact that he was being welcomed back into the city that had once sent him away, that his beard mingled with the hairs of the domestic animal on whose back he rode. Mm. So low was his head bowed. Mm. But he allowed a former black slave to climb to the top of what Muslims believe to be the house of God constructed by Abraham and Ismail and to make the call to prayer. And I show this image just as a reminder that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, once said, emulate the blacks, for from among them are three lords of the people of paradise. Um, Luqman the sage, who is the subject of an entire chapter of the Quran, the Christian king of Abyssinia, the Negus of Abyssinia, who gave shelter to the Muslims when they were fragile, um, and Bilal the Muazzin, who makes the call to prayer. So the point in this reminder to my co-religionists and to anyone assembled is that as the messenger of God, alayhi afdal salatu wa salam, God's uh, most perfect blessings upon him, 
considered black people as apt exemplars of knowledge and piety in the religion, that it's about time y'all started paying attention to. <laughs> That uh, focus on knowledge transmission and schooling in West Africa produced literacy rates in West Africa in the 17th and 18th centuries that were higher than literacy rates anywhere in Europe at that time. So while the barbarous trade that brought uh, people like that uh, man to the Savannah Dock in 1806 was rooted in a racist doctrine that suggested that blacks were subhuman and incapable of the same intellectual achievements as whites, while this discourse was being deployed, there were nonetheless African Muslim slaves who kept plantation records for their masters in Arabic mm -hmm. because their masters were illiterate in any language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How's that for irony? <laughs> and that these systems of schooling were not just designed to cultivate Islamic sensibilities in men, like the man standing at that Savannah dock in 1806, but women. Um, for all of the periods that I've been able to document historically, girls have made up um, roughly 30% of the contingent in Quran schools going back a thousand years in West Africa. Mm -hmm. And in more recent decades, they make up more than 50% of the students in most Quran schools. Mm -hmm. And just to give you some context, no European country achieved 30% um, scholarization rates for their female um, students until the 20th century. So this was a tradition that didn't just valorize the teaching of knowledge to men, but also um, the sharing of knowledge with women. Because we are all the children of Adam and Eve, male or female, black, brown, red, white, yellow, or anything in between. And that these traditions that were historical and that shaped um, Muslim experiences in the past, that shaped the experience of my ancestors as an African American, that shaped the experience of your spiritual ancestors as American Muslims, that those institutions which sustain them spiritually and intellectually continue today. That you can still find the teaching of the Quran the old fashioned way in West Africa mm -hmm. on wooden tablets that you see depicted in that previous image with the smiling <laughs> children and the smiling teacher. Um, that in West Africa today, um, this is almost the only place left on the face of the earth where children still learn the Quran the way that they did in the Prophet's own community in Medina. Mm -hmm. On the back of, uh, on wooden slate boards, um, they learn to memorize the text and to prove sometimes that they've memorized it. When it's time to recite, they put the board on top of their head so mm -hmm. that they can't see it and they recite the word. <laughs> and part of the uh, Embodying the text instead of just learning it between the ears, oftentimes when it comes time to erase the lesson and write a new one, they will lick the, tab the tablet clean, mm -hmm. bringing the word of God into their bi very bodies. Mm -hmm. These scholarly traditions continue to this day using tablets to draft poetry, to write, and the associated traditions of advanced learning that uh, accompany them are still alive and well in West Africa. This is a school where there were over 2,000 students studying advanced disciplines of the Islamic religious sciences, where there was no uh, university, no college, no state institution that grants any kind of degree for it. All that's given is a traditional ijaza or authorization to teach. Mm -hmm. And people came from 15 different West African countries to study there. I could go into a lot more detail about the role of Islam in the um, formative phase of West African history. Instead, I'll refer you to Africa's Great Civilizations, where this Professor Ware guy talks about it <laughs> at some length. So you notice I've slipped two shameless plugs <laughs> into the talk um, so far. Like, you know, go out and buy my first book, and also check out Africa's Great Civilizations. If you go out and buy that first book, part of the argument that's developed there is about um, what I'm going to speak to uh, tonight, which is it's not just important that there was Islam amongst the enslaved community and that Islam was established in um, places like Mexico in the 15 teens, mm -hmm. that the Muslim holidays of uh, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha were celebrated publicly throughout Mexico throughout the 1520s. 
It's not enough to say that Islam was present because there are surviving partial copies of the Quran that were written by people who had memorized the Quran, mm -hmm. that have been found in diverse American societies as far away from one another as Lima and Georgia. There have been partial copies of the Quran and legal texts found written by enslaved Muslims in Trinidad and Tobago, in Jamaica, in Martinique, in Haiti. Um, this system of embodying and internalizing the book meant that you could be stripped naked, thrown in the hold of a slave ship, shipped 5,000 miles from everything that you ever knew, and you could still bring your knowledge into the world because you were the book. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to say that there was Islam, but what kind of Islam was it? What was the humanistic call that was at the heart of that Savannah man's proclamation of the liberty of humankind? He was expressing um, the form of Islam that had been sustained over a thousand years in West Africa. And it's important to first and foremost say that Islam was established in West Africa without any military conquest. There was no external military conquest from North Africa, from the Arabian Peninsula that established Islamic rule in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there, was a, uh, there were efforts at conquest once up along the Nile River in 652 CE, um, and the Egyptian armies, when they encountered, encountered the Nubian army, the Christian Nubian army uh, in what's now Sudan, said that the Nubian archers can put an arrow into your eye from 300 paces away, so we signed a truce. <laughs> <laughs> While they were conquering everywhere from Spain to India, um, Africa proved to be impenetrable. So instead what happened is that merchants and scholars brought the faith south of the Sahara and before long indigenous West African lineages adopted the religion voluntarily and began spreading it to their brothers and sisters south of the Sahara. And it was in institutions like those humble Quran schools that Islam was spread, village to village, town to town, heart to heart, by people who embodied the text within themselves and sought to transmit it to others. It was the jihad of the wooden board and not the jihad of the sword that brought Islam to West Africa. And one of the humble lessons that I'll submit to my Muslim co-religionists that are gathered here today is that if we want to see the, spe the peaceful spread of our faith in this place, then we have uh, no further to look for relevant models than our West African ancestors who brought Islam to these shores in bondage. Their ethic and approach to uh, teaching Islam was predicated on a separation of the religious estate from the political estate. One of the um, most common statements that is attributed to Islam as a religion is that there is no separation between religion and politics in Islam. Islam din wa dawla, that Islam is religion and governance. This is sometimes quoted as though it were a hadith, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or that it was a quotation from the Quran, but it was actually an aphorism that was coined by 19th century political Islamists um, who did not uh, um, understand the way that um, traditionally in most uh, Muslim societies, religious scholars themselves actively tried to separate themselves from political authorities. In the West, we have evolved institutions to separate church and state in order to protect the state from the church. In West Africa and in many other Muslim societies in the pre-modern period, the separation of church and state was cultivated to protect the church from the state to allow religious scholars and people of piety and knowledge to preserve a safe distance from the corridors of political authority so that they could serve as an autonomous agent of critique for the way in which power was executed within a society. Because if the people who are supposed to critique rulers from the standpoint of ethics and religion and morality become the rulers, then who will criticize them when they exceed the bounds? This separation of church and state in the medieval period expressed itself uh, in this way. The most famous town in that time, the most famous uh, center of religious scholarship was a place called Jaha or Jaha. 
and they said that the king of Mali, the king of Mali, by the way, in the 14th century, um, uh, was the wealthiest man on the face of the earth. I'm contacted every year by two or three journals or um, uh, online uh, information services that ask me to describe the wealth of Mansa Musa for an article that they're preparing on the wealthiest people in world history. They always put Mansa Musa in first place, um, and they estimate usually his net worth adjusted for in inflation at 400 billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. Africa wasn't always poor. Mm -hmm. um, educate yourselves. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, Mansa Musa was the wealthiest person on the face of the earth in the 1320s and 1330s. Just the, the gold that he carried with him when he made pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324-1325 devalued the gold currency in Cairo by half for three decades after he left. And his point was, look, this is just what I'm carrying around in my pocket. Come back, come back to Mali and we'll show you how we get down. <laughs> But a man that was that wealthy and powerful was uh, prohibited from violating the sanctity of clerical communities. Those religious families that had come to specialize in the teaching of the Quran and the spreading of Islamic knowledge, if you reached the sanctuary of their safe haven towns, if you had killed the, the king of Mali's own son, mm -hmm. he could not come in and pursue you. The modus vivendi, the means of living that was established between religious and political authorities, was that they each respected one another's autonomy in their respective spheres. And it was the role of the king to come and uh, seek counsel with the scholar. It was not the role of the religious person or the scholar to try to go chasing after favor at the court of kings. Mm. And there are lessons uh, uh, in that for us. Um, as believing activists of all faiths. That town of Jaga that was inviolable, inviolable even to the most powerful man on the face of the earth at the time gave birth to what is the longest surviving tradition of instruction in West Africa, the Jahanke tradition. I've been able to document that people that claim origin from that town of Jaga have been teaching the Quran in West Africa in a continuous unbroken chain uh, since at least 800 CE, so for the last 1,200 years. Um, and that Jahanke tradition is part of what I'm going to focus on for the next few minutes because they crystallized a series of ethical principles about how people of faith ought to interact with people of other faiths in order to um, both affirm their faith and affirm the humanity of people that believed other than them. And I think that that's a useful message for an interfaith gathering. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there is a, an auspicious exemplar of this Jahanke tradition from um, the country of Gambia that is teaching these kinds of lessons and bringing this kind of teaching to contemporary North American audiences, Imam Fode Drame. We were blessed when I was at the University of Michigan to be able to invite him to give lectures at the University of Michigan a number of times. He's also spoken at Princeton University and other places and he's based out of Vancouver, and in many ways he is continuing to renew this tradition of teaching um, in North America. There are also many other West African scholarly communities, including Sufi orders. We have some prominent representatives of such here. I won't mention, mention them by name, so it's not embarrass them. But West African scholars are doing this uh, humanistic work um, amongst us, even if uh, they're often ignored. So, first principle of the Jahangi tradition, Unbelief is a result of a lack of knowledge rather than inherent wickedness or evil. Um, do not demonize people who believe other than you. Don't think of them <clears throat> as wicked people. Don't think of them as bad people. Think of yourself as having been blessed with useful knowledge. Um, and that if you have a role, it is to live and embody that useful knowledge and hope that um, people will come to ask you about what it is that you believe that caused you to act in the way that you act. <coughs> Concomitant with the first point is that if some people remain uh, in a position of unbelief, it's certainly God's will that they're in that state. When he wants to decree a matter, he has only to say unto a thing, be, and it is. If there are some people who believe and some people who do not, and some people who believe other than you, and some people that believe with you, certainly all of it is in God's will. 
to rebel openly against that state of affairs is at some level to not accept God's decree, to not accept God's word. And this follows with another point, or is followed by another point which is drawn straight from Quran, from Surah Baqarah, should be the 256th ayah. La ikraha fi din, there is no compulsion in religion. So true conversion can only occur in God's time. Believing people, take some pressure off of yourselves. <laughs> conversion will happen when God wants it to, not when you want it to. Um, and there is no compulsion in religion. The contemporary West African scholar, Sheikh Tijani Sise, uh, writes in one of his important essays, he said, when you compel someone to believe in a thing, you don't be gain a believer, you gain a hypocrite. Mm. <laughs> so at a fundamental level, any kind of compulsion is directly at odds with faith. Therefore, this part should be obvious that Aggressive military action of any kind is never an acceptable means for converting people to a religion, period. Because when you compel a person to obey, you have not gained a believer. Armed action of any kind is legitimate in their principles only in self-defense to protect the very survival of your community. If someone comes to extinguish your community, you are allowed to defend yourselves. We can all agree on that. Muslims may support non-Muslim rule as long as they are allowed to practice Islam. Not only are they allowed to, but they are encouraged to support non-Muslim non rule. The political philosophy of the Jahanke was that the only um, political system under which Muslims could not live was the absence of a political system because under system, under the absence of political order, chaos ensues and power fights power and all humanity is harmed. It is always better to support an established political authority when it gives you freedom of religion than to risk the fall into political chaos. In environments where you are a minority community, simply have the obligation to present an example to be emulated through your deeds, not through your words. The Jahanke discouraged active proselytizing. They, this thing that Muslims refer to as dawah, calling people to Islam, was a thing that they considered as um, uh, most effectively accomplished without speaking about the principles of your faith. They focused instead on providing benefit to all of the communities that surrounded them. The basic practice of this was simply to cook a lot of food as alms and give it away, away every Friday. To establish dispensaries and healing facilities and to serve their neighbors, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. To open those Quran schools, which in some other countries are reserved only for Muslims, to anybody that was interested in coming to school to learn to read and write spreading the practical benefits of literacy, of reflection on ethics, and of attempting to embody faith in practice. If you do that, you will not have to tell people what you believe, they will come and ask you. And finally, to make scholarship the center of your own life, so in spite of the fact that you are surrounded by people who believe other than you, that you are continuing to make progress in your own understanding of your faith. That you are continuing to make progress not just in analytical knowledge, but in spiritual knowledge. That you can continue to grow in what you believe, so that whatever you embody to the broader society carries light with it. And I'm gonna to begin to move to the closing and eventually I'll bring us back to that Savannah doc in 1806, but I'm gonna talk just briefly about this point of scholarship because it has become really the central feature of that West African scholarly tradition. This is a 19th century scholar, Shay Ahmed Obama Mbake, who just in what um, uh, university trained academics have been able to catalog of his written works, um, com composed no less than 200 distinct books in the Arabic language, some of them collections of as many as 200 poems, some of those poems uh, having as many as 5,000 lines in length. So I'm just gonna let you guys do the math real quick. <laughs> 200 
200 books, as many as 200 poems, as many as 5,000 lines. Um, this is one of the most prodigious poets in human history. And because he's black, and because he's a Muslim, uh, none of y'all have heard of him except those of you who have taken my class and listened to my class. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> Not just a scholar, but um, living out uh, and embodying those ethics. Bumble was once asked um, to provide a talisman that would give protection to a disciple that came to him seeking protection from the harm of the world. And we began our gathering tonight with a reflection on all the danger that surrounds us, all the harm that is being visited upon people of faith, all the harm that is being uh, visited upon the children of Adam generally. So this person came asking for protection against individual harm for them. And they wanted some kind of charm that would give them protection. So Ahmed Bamba said, you want a charm? Men said yes. He said, I'll give you the best charm. Uldaf Kenrubon, cause harm to no one. Ulwah Kenrubon, speak ill of no one. Uliyane Kenrubon, form no ill intentions towards anyone. If you are capable of these three, any intentions that are evil that are formed against you will fall back on the one who formed them. That's your talisman. That is our charm against evil when we come together as believing people who face a world that is in, intent in some cases upon doing us harm, individually, collectively, divided or together. We must swear this oath not to harm one another, not to speak ill of one another, not to have even ill intentions towards one another, so that we can stand arm in arm as people who believe other than uh, that don't necessarily shame, share the same beliefs, but who nonetheless believe. Bamba also affirmed the basic principles of liberty that were articulated by that man at that Savannah dock because there was actually a long history of anti-slavery movements in West Africa. If you want to read about those, you can read about them in chapter three of my book, and there's also some talks that I've given online that you can find at the Schomburg Center for the Study of Black Culture and other places. But I'll just give you one of Bamba's quotes that is expressive of this, this tradition. Um, when before slavery had been legally abolished in, uh, in the Senegal region, someone came to him so impressed by his knowledge and piety that they offered him the gift of a slave to serve him. And he asked, he said, you own that man? And he said, yeah, I own him. And Bamba's response was, if you own him, then you own me, because he and I have the same master. Yeah. Oh. That sensibility is what that man was expressing on that Savannah dock that day in 1806. We are all creations of God, and we are all born free. That ethical tradition that was rooted in a profoundly Islamic humanism survived the travails of slavery. The Works Project Administration um, that was founded by FDR during the Great Depression that is responsible for many of the highways and roads that run through this great nation um, because it was designed to put America back to work, also put a bunch of unemployed and perhaps unemployable graduate students to work as well. <laughs> Sorry for the graduate students in the room. That was just for you guys. Um, they interviewed the last generation to have known slavery in their direct personal experience in the 1930s. People who had, were in their 70s and 80s and who had seen their parents, um, uh, had, who had been slaves themselves and who their parents and grandparents had been slaves, so they interviewed them. And this quotation on the right shows that in the 1930s, um, the experience of Muslim slaves was still in living memory. This is from a quote from Sapelo Island, not far from Savannah, where that man was put into bondage. They used to say that Bilali and Hiwai Phoebe pray on the beat. They were very particular about the time they pray, and they very regular about the hour. When the sun come up, when it's straight overhead, and when it set, that's the time they pray. They bow to the sun and have a little mat to kneel on. 
the peace is on a long string. Bilali, he pulled a bead and he said, Bilali, how about a Muhammad? Phoebe, she said, Amin, Amin. In spite of the violence of slavery, um, Islam survived into the 20th century in the African-American community. It survived for some as a system of coherent religious practice, but it survived for all as a cultural legacy that just became part of African-American culture. Because when 15% of the enslaved are Muslims, then Islamic institutions are gonna be hiding in plain sight in African-American culture, whether we know that they come from Islamic sources or not. And uh, if we had more time, I would tell you a few stories um, about how deeply embedded that Islam is in just folk culture in the South. But I'm gonna close with a final reminder that is also drawn from West African Islamic teaching um, and that will hopefully give us um, the resources, spiritual and intellectual, to face the storm clouds that are gathering uh, in front of us and that stand um, in the way of us standing arm in arm um, against the forces of darkness. And it's a reminder from the Quran of our common humanity. It's a reminder that whether it is racial prejudice, cultural pride, religious chauvinism, that all of these are expressions of a broader sin that the Quran identifies as kibr or istikbar, arrogance, pridefulness. Sheikh Ahmed Bamba, who I mentioned a few moments ago, said the cure to this grief, he said, never forget that it was this sin that brought low the cursed Satan. Pride. Yes, that's Why? Because when he was commanded to bow to this most noble of creations, which is the human form, he refused. He said, I'm better than him. You made me from fire and you made him from clay. And in Islamic conception, Satan is the first racist, he's the first chauvinist. He claims on the basis of his origin and bodily substance that he is better than all of you and he seeks to persuade you in your own communities, your ethnic communities, your racial communities, your religious communities, to see those that are other than you the same way that he sees all of us, as a contemptible ball of mud, which is not worth bowing before. So to return to Bamba's narration, he said, never forget that it was this arrogance, this pride, that brought low the cursed Satan. We seek refuge in God from both of them, from Satan and from pride. <laughs> then he said, the cure is to contemplate your body and how it was created. You begin your life as a nasty drop of sperm. You live your life as a walking sack of feces. And you end your life as a corpse, odious and rotten. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, this is true. You are all the children of Adam. <laughs> and it is from dirt that you were created. Yeah. What kind of sense does it make for creatures of dirt to rank themselves hierarchically against other creatures of dirt? What kind of sense does it make for creatures of dirt to slay other creatures of dirt in order to possess more dirt on which to stand? <laughs> the truth of our existence is that we all come from the same origin and we are all returning to the same point of origin. The Quran reminds us when Moses, God give him the most high blessings and give him peace. When Moses took his message of justice to Pharaoh with his brother Aaron, peace be upon him as well, he was given the task of reminding a violent oppressor. And what did he say? He talked about how God brings forth the fruits from the earth and brings forth the rain from the sky. My God made you out of earth. He's gonna return you to the earth and he's gonna bring you back out of it one more time to be judged. We came out of the ground and we're gonna go back into the ground and all that we're gonna take with us is our deeds. All that we're gonna take with us is the contents of our hearts. 
if we are aware that this is our condition, then we will honor one another. We will honor one another because we know that there is a special secret that ennobles these otherwise dirty balls of mud <laughs> that start out as sperm, live as sacks with feces, and end as rotting corpses. Mm -hmm. The Quran tells us that God fashioned the form of Adam with his own two hands in contradistinction to everything else which he created through acts of speech. Let there be light. But God made the human being with his own two hands. He says to this Satan, why did you not bow to that which I made with my own two hands? But it wasn't just that he made the human form with his own two hands, he also breathed of his own uncreated spirit into the frame of Adam to animate it. Humanity is created with a caress and animated with the kiss of life. It is not for nothing that the Quran never uses the term God loves, except that the direct object of the verb to love is a human being. And I humbly submit to you, people of all faiths and people of no faith at all, that the truth in the story of mankind's creation is a sacred and precious reminder um, of our duty here and our reason to be here in the first place. Because when the angels were told of the creation of Adam and that he would be given charge and his descendants over the earth, they protested. They said, are you gonna create something that's gonna cause mischief and shed blood in the earth? And God said, I know and you know not. And at that moment, the angels obeyed because that's what angels do. It's a paraphrase, not a quote from the Quran. They say, yes, sir, God, sir. <laughs> But what's the nature of their question? They know that this is a disobedient being. They know that this is a being that is going to cause mischief and shed blood, that's going to walk into mosques and shoot people, that's going to walk into synagogues and shoot people, that's going to walk into black churches and shoot people, that is going to cause mischief and shed blood in the earth. And God said, I know and you don't know. What does God know that we don't know, that the angels don't know? He knows that he is creating a being that has free will, that has choice. Because it is beneath his dignity to love a thing that is forced to obey him. It is beneath God's dignity to love something that is forced to obey him. The human being is given free will so that the human being can choose God or other than God. Could you love a thing if it was forced to obey you? Mm. That is the secret in our creation. That is the secret in our purpose, is that we exist so that something in God's creation would be worthy of his love. And that is what is at the heart of Islamic humanism in West Africa. The understanding that in every single one of the children of Adam and Eve is God's most precious investment, his love. Peace be upon you all.